You know, his statue is almost pulled down. Do you know about him? He's one of the most fascinating people in American history. If he walked into this room, I'd probably run out that door. Because you look at him funny, he, he'll want to kill you. He's, he, he kills, he's the only president who actually killed people. Personally killed people. Teddy Roosevelt claims to have killed somebody in the Battle of San Juan. Yeah, personally killed people. Like, and he's actually did it many times. We don't know how many, 16, 20, 25, 28. He didn't brag about it, he just did it. That poor guy was, oh my God, why am I digressing on Andrew Jackson? He was the first president to be almost assassinated. Guy pulls out two pistols, shoots, both of them misfire. Andrew Jackson nearly beats the guy to death. Oh my God. So anyhow, this, uh, Andrew Jackson is just a fascinating character. But uh, he had a trigger temper, was really hot-headed. Can you imagine how mad he was that he didn't get the White House here? Wow. Uh, the second time was the election of 1876. It's a, this is a crazy election where the popular vote was contested. The electoral vote was also contested, and it couldn't even be thrown into the House of Representatives. There had to be a special commission to create it. But clearly one thing that everybody agreed on then and today is that this guy Samuel Tilden won the popular election pretty much. I mean, he won, a, he won probably a majority of the popular vote. He also probably won in the Electoral College. But by an agreement, he was denied the White House. And Luther B. Hayes uh, got the White House, and he was called for the rest of his term his fraudulence. You know? So it was a, uh, a This was much more straightforward. This is how, this is how it usually works. When somebody wins the popular vote, like whoever Cleveland did, uh, but loses the Electoral College, uh, this is how they usually do it. You win. If you want to win the popular vote and lose in the Electoral College, the way to do it is this. You win big in the states, you win big. You win. You win big in the states if you win, and you lose narrowly in the states if you lose. And that's exactly what Grover Cleveland did. Uh, he clearly beat Benjamin Harrison in the popular vote, but Benjamin Harrison won in the Electoral College, so he became president. Most of you here remember the election of 2000, the closest election in American history. 100 million votes. Fewer than 500,000 votes separated Bush from Gore. Unbelievable. But now Gore did squeak out a popular vote victory lost in the electoral college. And then finally, election of 2016, Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump by three percentage points, uh, but lost in the electoral college. Uh, so the kind of the, the electoral college has this curve, has this immunity to popular will. It is very difficult for Americans to, most Americans don't understand it, and Europeans really don't understand it. They really don't get it. They don't get how it can be possible that somebody loses the popular vote and yet wins the White House, but it happens. But the, the, the Electoral College is a whole other conversation that you know maybe I can get into it another time, because now I'm really focusing on just voting in elections in general. And it wasn't just the Electoral College that built curbs against democracy. It was also the rules about who could vote. The Constitution says nothing about it. Nothing. It left all those decisions up to the states. And the states could come up with all kinds of qualifications about who could vote, and they did. So voting in this country has been a crazy quilt patchwork of different rules and different patterns according to states. So for example, in 1776, New Jersey allowed women to vote. And they voted for 30, good for them. They took it away in 1807. Took it away in 1807. Um, North Carolina, slave state. Maryland, slave state. Allowed African Americans, free African Americans to vote early in the republic. Took that away also. Uh, but uh, those, they were kind of exceptions. For most places, the qualification to vote is you had to be white, male, 21 years of age. And in the early years of the Republic, you had to own property. You know, you had to own property. Uh, this, this map shows that uh, all the states in green or red had essentially property qualifications for voting. So the red ones had tax paying qualifications, but the tax was on property, so it represented property. Uh, Virginia, you had to own 50 acres of land. 
to love. Rhode Island, more than that. South Carolina, more than that, even maybe even a slave or two in South Carolina to vote. This was very common. There were only two states in 1800 that allowed all white men over the age of 21 to vote, and that was Vermont and Kentucky. That's it. All the rest had property qualifications. So it was not unusual for a state like Virginia to have, you know, 50% of your free white male adult population eligible to vote. Only 50%. So there weren't that many voters. The story of the 19th century, the story of the 1800s, is the opening up of the opportunity for white men to vote. At the same time, there's a closing off of opportunity for women and African Americans, but there's a drastic opening up of free white men over the age of 21 who are allowed to vote. Here is the situation in 1800. All the brown and green states have property voting qualifications. Here it is in 1830. Look how yellow this is. All the yellow states have universal white male suffrage. By 1860, you have almost every state. Uh, South Carolina is really a big rollout. Uh, they have property qualifications still after the Civil War, um, and as is Rhode Island also. Uh, but you can see how the story really of American history in the 19th century is this flowering, this blossoming of the popular vote. This is the period where our nation starts to become a democracy in the 1800s. And the champion of this movement, the symbolic leader of this movement, and the beneficiary of this movement was this guy behind me, Andrew Jackson. He was the leader of this movement. He didn't really lead it. He was a figurehead. He was the champion. He was the, what's the word for figure? Another word for figurehead. Symbolic, what? He like, looks like a puppet. He looks like, or I look like a puppet. Um, yeah, he, he's been, there's been a lot of comparisons with him and Donald Trump, and I think they're absolutely valid. I think they're very valid. They're really interesting comparisons, an outsider, uh, nobody had ever, well, I'll talk about him a little bit more, uh, really an outsider to the American political system, who kind of comes in and disrupts everything, disrupts everything, really transformed our political system. And what Jackson wanted to do, and he served two terms as president, what he wanted to do was to turn this country into a democracy. He did not succeed. These are some of the things he was for. Popular election of the Supreme Court, don't have that. Never got it done. Uh, the abolition of the Electoral College. Hated the Electoral College after all. It denied him in the White House in 1824. Uh, the popular election of senators. That was only achieved in 1913. And he also wanted to abolish the military academy at West Point. Um, yeah, it, we, we don't know. We've lost this part of our history. But West Point was really, really controversial. Uh, Jackson was a military man. I mean, he was a colonel and a general. Uh, but he hated West Point. He thought West Point was producing an aristocratic class of officers. And you, I've talked to a few vets. Excuse me? Did you not get into it? <laughs> he didn't want to get into it. Um, uh, and and it was, it was, it was West Point was unpopular. Uh, so he wanted to abolish it. He didn't succeed in that. In fact, Andrew Jackson, didn't, the only things he succeeded in doing were really harmful to the country, in my opinion. Uh, and he did succeed in, in a few things. But it didn't turn out good, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the story of the 1800s is really this opening up of the franchise, the opening up of suffrage. People are voting for the first time. And every, every one of these states, there's a big struggle over this opening up of the vote. And it's, it's contested, you know? There are elites who have the power who don't want to open up the franchise to all white populist men. And the first, the last great struggle of this era is really the little-known Door Rebellion in Rhode Island in 1841. The Door Re Rhode Island was one of those states like South Carolina. Rhode Island and South Carolina were the most conservative, the most elitist, the most restrictive in who can vote. There were property qualifications out the wazoo. The uh, state constitution for Rhode Island and the Providence Plantations, as the state is called officially, uh, was really the royal charter that was granted in 1663. It goes back that, and what that royal charter says is, not many people can vote. You have to be a landholder, a big landholder. 
even if you own land like in an urban area, that ain't gonna cut it. So representation in the state legislature was, cities were underrepresented in the state legislature, the countryside was overrepresented. So you have really the state run by a cabal of large plantation property owners. And they have a stranglehold on power in Rhode Island. Thomas Dore was a radical member of the Rhode Island State Legislature. He was no ruffian. He was a graduate of Harvard University. He was an attorney. He was Harvard University. I think so. That makes sense. That sounds right to me. Um, he was an attorney. He was the son of a prominent manufacturer. And he tried to reform the system. He tried to kind of liberalize the system. Get more. He was for all men. He was actually for African American civil rights. He wanted all men to be able to vote. And uh, eventually he was so frustrated that he eventually went rogue. He set up his own constitutional convention. They drew up a people's constitution. And uh, that allowed, in the end, all white men over the age of 21 to vote in Rhode Island. They held a statewide, statewide referendum on this constitution, and it won overwhelmingly. And the first thing the constitution called for was the uh, it was for elections of the state legislature and the governor. Thomas Dore was elected governor. His supporters, Dore Wrights, were elected to the state legislature, and they began governing Rhode Island. The only problem was there was another governor and another state legislature under the Royal Charter in Providence also running Rhode Island. So you had two governments of Rhode Island, two capitals of Rhode Island, and they went to war with each other. The, uh, there was the governor, Samuel Ward King, he called up a militia, the militia, to march on the rival capital. The rival Thomas Dore called up his militia, they marched on Providence. The Dorites arrived in Providence first, they had a big cannon, they, they lined up the arsenal, they wanted to take out all the weapons of the state capitol, they pulled the lanyard, and the gun was fired. And all the Dorites fled. Thomas Dore was captured, he was tried for treason against the state of Rhode Island, found guilty, and sentenced to a life at hard labor. He was eventually released from prison, pardoned, but it had physically and mentally broken him. He was a broken man, and he died shortly after being released. Still to this day, Rhode Island still does. Here's his grave marker. You can say it says Governor Thomas Wilson Dorr. The state officially lists him as a governor of Rhode Island, uh, a member of the People's Constitution. So but this was the last gasp, really, of those who were against universal white male suffrage, the door, the putting down of the Dorr Rebellion. Rhode Island would eventually, by 1888, I think they have to grant all universal male suffrage. Uh, and and it, but it, it took them to almost the Civil War to grant um, uh, universal white male suffrage after the death of Thomas Dore. So you can imagine, you know, in this case of Rhode Island notwithstanding, that throughout the nation, elections, which we had never really had that many before, are now becoming a big deal. You're having thousands and thousands of people voting in elections. Uh, in, by the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, who had never voted in elections before. And the people, the, the person that they voted for overwhelmingly was this guy, was, was Andrew Jackson. Uh, he, the ja Jacksonians, they, they were a movement unto themselves. It was a movement unto itself. Uh, you have, for the first time, real campaigning, you have posters, you know, you have kind of songs, and rallies, and it was all really for Andrew Jackson. And like I said, he didn't get that much. Andrew Jackson, there was nobody quite like him. There's no way Andrew Jackson would ever have become president if not for universal white male suffrage. No way. Nobody, nobody in the elites liked him. There had never been a president like him before. He was from the West, the first president from the West. He was poor, desperately poor. He was orphaned at age 12. Uh, he was poorly educated and entirely self-educated. He was a real rough frontiersman. He didn't, he wasn't that literate. His writing was semi-literate. He wasn't a great 
speech maker, you know, and he was tough as nails. He was involved in a lot of duels and involved in a lot of fighting. He was a real frontiersman. I mean, he was the real deal, absolutely the real deal. And he was the kind of guy that this new rabbit, white male rabbit, voting for the first time, loved. Uh, so Jackson was elected twice. He served two terms in the White House. And, but the real historians would say that the real, really the first modern election, modern campaign, I should say, the first modern campaign came in 1840 when uh, Andrew Jackson had spent his two terms and he had blessed his vice president, uh, Martin Van Buren, to become, to be elected as president. Uh, uh, the Jackson supported Van Buren greatly in, in Jackson's post White House retirement. And uh, Martin Van Buren so ran for re-election in 1840. Martin Van Buren is the answer to a great trivia question. Are you ready for this? Please promise me that you'll use this on somebody. It's a great one. It really is. Who is the only American president whose English was not his first language? Don't say Obama. <laughs> Martin Van Buren. He grew up speaking Dutch. He grew up in a pretty modest Dutch household in New York. He learned English as a second language. And boy, his opponent used, it, used that against him, of course, in 1840. 1840, um, uh, 1840 was, a, was a, a bad year in American history, the first economic depression. Uh, he was a vulnerable candidate running for re-election. And the party that put up a candidate against him was a party that had been around since at least 1830, 1830, 1829 maybe, and it was the Whig Party, W-H-I-G, named after the British Whig Party that opposed the crown in Great Britain. The Whigs, they were a cross-section of the country, kind of like, somewhat today, like those who are against Trump today. You know, you have kind of some conservative Republicans who are against Trump, and then you have liberal Democrats who are against Trump. That's kind of how the Whig Party was. You, they couldn't agree on anything. They disagreed on every issue except one. They hated Andrew Jackson. And they wanted him out. And they ran against Andrew Jackson from 1830 to 1840, and they lost every time. Jacksonians trounced the Whigs every time. The Whigs simply could not get it done. They could not kind of beat Andrew Jackson. And in 1840, they did something unusual. They really took a chance. You really have to admire them for this. Uh, instead of nominating for president the other people that they had nominated before, the two great luminaries of the Whig Party, Henry Clay, who was Abraham Lincoln's hero, and uh, Daniel Webster. Instead of, you know, everybody expected the Whigs to nominate Webster or Clay or some other luminary in the Whig Party. Instead, they reached out and tapped a pretty darn obscure and old guy. I mean, he was really old. He was like 67. <laughs> this guy, William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison was not really a household word by 1840. He had been a fairly well-known general in 1812. He, uh, the military general, had been territorial governor of, of Indiana. He had one really great military victory under his belt, the Battle of Thames River, where Tecumseh was killed. Um, uh, he also had a, a more mixed victory at the Battle of Tippecanoe, uh, again in the War of 1812. And so he was kind of like, he was not well known, he wasn't really known as a politician, uh, but he was a, a, a cipher. He was kind of an empty vessel that the Whigs could put out and kind of market as, a, as an outsider. They were trying to beat Andrew Jackson at his own game. Here's a frontiersman. He lives in Indiana. He's an Indian killer, an Indian fighter, tough as nails. He's like the second coming of Old Hickory, but he's a Whig. That was the idea. The only problem with William Henry Harrison is he liked to talk. And when he talked, it didn't sound too good. <laughs> he quoted ancient Greek stories. He quoted ancient Roman stories. Turns out he was an educated guy. 
And he spoke with kind of an elite accent. So they just had to kind of shut him up during most of the campaign. Um, they, they shut him up and they, they kind of marketed him as a frontiersman. And then they attacked Martin Van Buren, which was pretty easy to do because again, as I said, 1840, we were in the midst of the first and the greatest up to that time industrial depression or economic depression in American history. It was really, really bad. There were widespread unemployment and evictions. And you can see here's a kind of a cartoon about it. Here's the father of the house and uh, the debt collectors or the rent collectors coming through the door. And he has this impoverished family here, doesn't know what to do. Uh, and in this context, the Whigs painted Martin Van Buren as out of touch, an out of touch aristocrat, because he has kind of that fancy last name, out of touch aristocrat who wasn't addressing the problems of the day. And it's true he wasn't addressing the problems of the day. The problems were way too big for him. He was not skillful at, at, uh, you know, at addressing the problems of the Great Depression. But he also wasn't the luxury-loving aristocrat that the Whigs painted him out to be. There was a, a, a Pennsylvania congressman named Charles Ogle who gave a three-day speech on the floor, three-day speech, that's longer than this lecture, three-day speech on the floor of the, Cong the House of Representatives is called the Gold Spoon Oration. Three days Charles Ogle spent describing Martin Van Buren's daily life in the White House. It was a life filled with satin and silk, with jewels and gold, with champagne and fine French wines. Uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, he had Louis XIV furniture and kind of oriental carpets. And kind of, here's a great cartoon. There's Martin Van Buren drinking champagne. And here he is drinking hard American cider, which is the common man's drink. And like he's, you know, turning his nose up at it and rolling his eyes at it. Here's a not too subtle cartoon of Martin Van Buren being crowned king by the devil himself. You know, crowning him king. He was called Martin Van Ruin and Sweet Sandy Whiskers. And in order to try to get back at the Whigs and William Henry Harrison, a, 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 a reporter, an editor in Baltimore, made a big blunder. This editor, this, this uh, Democratic Party editor, started to attack William Henry Harrison as a country bumpkin, saying this guy is illiterate, you don't want him in the White House. You know, this uh, kind of the, the arguments that the Whigs had used against Andrew Jackson. And he said this, give him, meaning William Henry Harrison, a barrel of hard cider and settle, settle a pension of 2,000 a year on him. And take my word for it, he will sit the remainder of his days in his lost cabin. In other words, you give the guy a barrel of hard cider and a log cabin, he's going to be happy. He's that dumb. He's that much of a dumb country redneck. Oh my gosh. The Whigs embraced that quotation. They embroidered it on pillows. They put it on signs. They trumpeted William Henry Harrison as the hard cider and log cabin candidate. Everywhere Harrison went, he was the log cabin and hard cider candidate. He was the common man, as opposed to uh, Martin Van Buren. It was, you know, it, hard cabin and log, uh, uh, hard cider and log cabin campaign. The first real kind of marketed, he was the first real marketed candidate. The only problem was, William Henry Harrison wouldn't have known, you know, a barrel of hard cider if he tripped over it, you know? William Henry Harrison was the son of the Virginia governor. He came, he, this was the house he was born in. It's still there in Williamsburg, Virginia. I mean, he was a Virginia aristocrat, the richest of the richest of the, you know, seacoast elite. Um, he had a wine cellar. He really did not drink hard cider. He had a wine cellar in his house in Grouseland in, in Indiana. Um, but it was the way he was marketed. And this was really the first modern campaign where they had all kinds of campaign paraphernalia. They had china and glass and blankets and medallions struck. Uh, they had special bottles of booze. They, oh, drinking was a big part of, of uh, elections. The distillery E.G. Booze Company, don't you love, love that name? You know, signed up on the campaign and was there with whiskey for all the campaign rallies. These rallies were gigantic. They were gigantic. 
I usually roll into town, truly roll into town, with a big canvas call. The slogan was, keep the ball rolling. I don't quite understand this, but have you ever seen the show Parks and Rec? They do a whole thing about this as it takes place in Indiana. Uh, uh, Benjamin Harrison would pull this thing out also. William Henry Harrison, the campaign had a huge ball that they rolled down a country road into a village. And on the ball were all the things that Harrison was for. And there would be a party around the ball. In one town of Indiana, and I can't remember the name of the town, pretty small town, 60,000 people came out for this rally. Do you know why? E.G. Booze was there. Yeah. E.G. E. Booze was there, and it was a barbecue. And, and, and man, I mean, these were really big, crazy events. The first real big campaign rallies in American history. And it goes without saying that William Henry Harrison won the election. He beat Van Buren by, by seven points, trounced him in the Electoral College. But the real story of the election of 1840 is the turnout. 80% of eligible voters voted wow. in 1830. 80%. And that trend would continue for the next 60 or 70 years. Super high voter turnout because of all the excitement around these elections. You can see here's it. Voter turnout is low, and then in 1840, it's high for a long time, really until the 20th century. Well into the 20th century. Elections are very popular affairs. Okay, a couple more digressions. Um, William Henry Harrison is the answer to a trivia question, right? What trivia question is that? Shortest presidency. Shortest presidency. He, his presidency lasts for, what, 30 days? Yeah. William Henry Harrison. 30 days. 30 days, yeah. He was inaugurated on March 4th, I believe, and he died on April 4th. He gave a two-hour speech, which I have read on March 4th, out cold weather, so it's still the story goes. Two hours, he gives a speech in open air, cold weather, bad weather. After the speech doesn't feel well, takes to his bed, doesn't leave, dies 30 days later. So he spent his whole presidency in bed, same thing. And the story goes is he got pneumonia on that cold day, and, um, by the way, the speech is the most horrid thing I think I've ever read. Oh my gosh, you could read it on the internet. I challenge you to read the entire thing. It's horrible. it's really bad. Um, I can't believe you did it. So, uh, you know, nowadays, doctors say that almost certainly was not pneumonia that he died from. He, he probably died from a waterborne illness like typhoid or maybe salmonella. Um, and, and he probably would have survived but he made a fatal mistake that a lot of people made, especially wealthy people, in the 1800s when he got sick. And that fatal mistake was this. He allowed a doctor to treat him. <laughs> to, have a, to have a medical license in the 1800s was a license to kill. You were, you'd have a good chance of living if a doctor didn't touch you. <laughs> if a doctor starts circling around you, oh my god, they give you lead. They give you leeches, they give you mercury, uh, they give you mustard plasters that would cause third degree burns. They would make you swallow liquid that would burn the inside of your throat. I mean, they really, they bled people. They use something called snake roots. They, I think on Harrison, they use actual snakes. And so they, they kill them. And, um, I, and, and also, it's, it's almost certain that he died of salmonella or typhoid because the water in the White House was contaminated. And everybody knew, everybody who moved into the White House got sick. And most everybody survived it. But Harrison did not. He was older, I guess he was in great health, he, and doctors killed him. Um, but everybody got sick, and it took them a long time to make a connection to the septic pond that was uphill about 500 yards from the White House. There was no sewage system in Washington, D.C. in those days, so all the sewage ran into a septic pond, and that pond leached into the water system, into the water wells of the White House. So anybody who drank from the White House water wells would get typhoid or salmonella or some kind of waterborne disease. Here's a second meaningless digression, but it just this totally fascinates me. Okay, so William Henry Harrison dies after 30 days. His vice president is John Tyler, right? Who then served as president. John Tyler was born, he was 50 years old in 1840, 1841, 51 years old. John Tyler was born in 1790. He 
he has two surviving grandchildren. Oh. Isn't that amazing? There are two people in this country who are John Tyler's grandchildren. That fascinates me. <laughs> you got to do. It. You got to do some math here. So John Tyler, he had 13 kids. He had his last kid at age 63. Oh. Oh. And then his last kid was Lion Tyler. Lion Tyler had like 15 kids. And Lion Tyler had his last kid at age 75. Wow. And so the Lion Tyler's youngest children are still alive. Lion Tyler Jr. and Harrison Tyler, named after William Henry Harrison. They're still around. Isn't that amazing? That amazing. Um, okay, let me talk about what elections were like because uh, they were not elections were not at all like they are today. Uh, elections in the early years of the Republic were raucous, riotous, crazy, carnivalesque affairs with music and roasted ox and a lot of alcohol. Games played in the streets. Nobody worked. It was a holiday. You know, they weren't like the quiet, sober, almost sacred affairs that they are today. They were like a good time, you know? You poured out in the streets, you drink, you bowl, you fight, you gamble. You know, it was a holiday. It was truly a holiday. And then, during the you know, course of the riots, you go. Um, everybody knew that if you wanted to run for office, one thing you had to do was either pay your voters or um, give your voters alcohol. That was just expected. Every once in a while, you'd get a puritanical candidate who didn't believe in you know, paying off voters by giving them alcohol. Guys like George Washington, who was 26 years old, and in 1856, he ran for the House of Burgesses representative in, uh, in Virginia, and he refused to buy alcohol for voters, and he lost. He ran for, again, in 1758. And there's a wonderful document where he's essentially writing this to his campaign manager. Here's the alcohol I want you to buy. 28 gallons of rum, 50 gallons of rum punch, 34 gallons of wine, 46 gallons of beer, and two gallons of cider royal, all for 397 voters. That's a lot of alcohol for 397 voters. He won. He won. And he bought alcohol for voters uh, all, all after that. And I say, since that's the voice of the people is the voice of Brock. There was a lot of drinking and a lot of commotion on election day. And in the carnival, right in the midst of it, was the election judge sitting behind a desk or table with uh, usually a candidate over here and a candidate over here and the sheriff right next to the election judge. And then you'd have a few drinks, you'd party, you'd sing, sing some songs, you'd play a game, and then you'd stumble up to the table and you'd say, my name is Todd DePastino. And you'd have the two candidates, Mr. Jones and Mr. Smith over here. And I live at 200 Magnolia Place, and I vote for Mr. Jones. That's how you cast your vote. And the, all the supporters of Mr. Jones would cheer. Mr. Jones would take his hat off, bow, thank you for the vote. Mr. Smith would shake his head in disgust. You'd go back to your game. The supporters of Mr. Smith would give you a punch. The supporters of Mr. Jones would buy you a drink. And you'd go back to your games. That's how people voted. It was no secret ballot. That, it was called voice voting. This was very common, especially in the early years of the Republic. Sometimes, you know, if things got complicated, they would use balls, black balls and white. Put a black ball in for this candidate, or a white ball in for that candidate. In fact, the word ballot comes from the Italian ballata, meaning ball, meaning little ball. That's where we get the term ballot, how you vote. So voting was very, very public. Rarely were there written ballots, because uh, election judges didn't supply the paper or the pencil, or you had to write it yourself. You had to get the name right, spell the name right, you had to spell the office right. That would be a problem. A sonitary, controller, you misspell those words, your vote is encountered. So it was very rare to have a you know, write-in ballot. But as the suffrage expanded, as these elections grew big, as more and more people voted, these elections became really big, unruly affairs, and you just couldn't have the voice votes anymore. You needed paper ballots, 
And so the political parties, and these were new political parties, the Democratic Party and the Whig Party, they began doing something novel. They printed their own ballots. So all you had to do as you were stumbling through your day on election day was reach out, grab one of these ballots from one of the campaigners, and if you couldn't read it, it didn't matter, you just knew that yellow was a Whig ballot, blue was a Democrat ballot, and you just stumble to the election judge and you'd hand him the ballot. These ballots were pre-printed. They were the size exactly of a railroad ticket. And most printers in the 1800s made their money on printing railroad tickets. And they just used the same format for these political ballots. That's why we call them tickets. You know, uh, the, 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 you know the Trump, Pence ticket. Uh, that's where the term comes from. These were, people called them tickets because they were the exact size of the railroad ticket. And they were color coded, very easy to read. Every once in a while, you would, here's one for, you know, the Republican ticket, Abraham Lincoln, Virginia, 1860. Um, here's the Douglas one in 1860, it's blue. Um, every once in a while, somebody, an ornery person might get, if they took their vote very seriously, they might want to vote for some Republicans and some Democrats. So what did they do? They split the ticket. They literally cut it, you know, and they kept the people that they wanted, and then they pasted them together. Uh, or you could paste the name over. Uh, it was called a paster. They glued names over. So there were pasters, there were split tickets. People used tickets. But even when people were voting like this, uh, they were putting them not in ballot boxes. They were putting them in glass ballot globes. Everybody saw that was really important. No secret ballot. Everybody had to see who you were voting for. A secret ballot was distrusted. How could you trust somebody to vote virtuously in secret? If you let people vote in secret, do you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna vote in their own self-interest. In any republic that has citizens who are only after their own self-interest, it's not gonna last. You have to have voters who are going to vote virtuously, meaning they're going to vote for the good of the whole, of the commonwealth. And people will only do that in public. Why would you be so ashamed of your vote that you have to hide it? You should be proud of your vote. So these were these were ballot blows. They would see that you were putting in a yellow ticket or a blue ticket, so they knew exactly who you were voting for. As you can imagine, this kind of public voting meant that there was a lot of intimidation and a lot of fights on election day. These are cartoons by Thomas Nast, which is here showing African American voters voting for the first time uh, after the Civil War in the South. And they're putting their ballots in globes. Here is one, this, look closely at this. Here's an African American voter coming in with his ticket. He's going to put it in this globe here. And he has some very rough, angry, mean looking white guys facing him down, clearly trying to intimidate him and his vote. You better not vote for those darn Republicans what these white southerners are saying to the black voter. This kind of intimidation was super, super common. Super common. It was, it was, it was guaranteed, if you were gonna go out and vote, guaranteed you were going to be assaulted by someone. Because candidates hired gangs to police the streets to keep the opponent's voters away from the polls. So it was very common to be beat up to get into fights on election day. Fighting was really a big part of it. And there were a lot of cases where like, somebody would go out to vote and they would be knocked out cold and they would not be able to vote and they would sue the candidate for stopping them because they were able to trace the person who knocked them out to be a higher thug of the candidate. They would sue the candidate, the, the case would go to court and the judge would rule, hey, if you want to vote, you better be able to fight for your candidate. That was a common judicial view of this whole thing. That politics is a rough and tumble sport. You should be able to, you know, you should be able to, uh, to, to, to you know, face up um, uh, to the, uh, you know, to the violence in the streets in support of your candidate. Yes. Where would they go to get these three tickets? Great question. The tickets were printed in newspapers. They were printed in magazines, and they were also handed out. Uh, by candidates' teams 
on election day. Like hand it out, so you just give one to every person who walked by. Yeah. Um, the person who really introduced the secret ballot, and in those days it was called the Australian ballot, to the United States was this guy, Henry George. Henry George is not a household name, he's not a well-known name today, but he was once a very famous American. Back in 1890, he was voted third greatest American, uh, third greatest living American behind Mark Twain and Thomas Edison. Uh, Henry George was really a celebrity. He was a figure. He ended up writing a book uh, that came out before 1880 called Progress and Poverty. And it, it asked the question, why in this age of progress we have so many poor people in our cities? And he had an answer. The answer was rent. And he called for a single tax, a confiscatory tax on rent, and we would have more economic inequality in the country. It became a really popular book, a best-selling book, and it also was the book that led to this board game, the Landlord's Game, which became Monopoly, exactly. Because really, Monopoly is all about Henry George's theories of rent and tax. Um, but before he wrote Progress and Poverty, which is still really an interesting book to read, uh, he was a cabin boy and a steamer, and he spent some time in Australia, and he saw how Australia did elections, and they did it by the secret ballot. It was the only kind of country that did it. So when he came back to San Francisco, he wrote a book. He self-published a book about the secret ballot. And he campaigned for the secret ballot. That the secret ballot would make our elections more civilized, would make our elections less violent. And you know, he campaigned up and down the country, and there wasn't that much interest in it. People were very suspicious of it. Lysander Spooner, who was a well-known commentator at the time, said, the secret ballot makes for a secret government. Uh, John Randolph, who's a descendant of the famous Randolph family, said, the adoption of the secret ballot would make any nation a nation of scoundrels. It really, the idea of a secret ballot only caught on after the Civil War, in the 1870s, 1880s, when political violence got really bad. Really bad. And here's the statistic, it gives you a sense. In Louisiana alone, in 1868, there were 1,000 political murders in Louisiana alone. The election of 1876 was super violent also. I mean, mass casualties. You just knew that every two years, every four years, we're going to have a lot of murder rate is going to spike. And so the idea was adopted. Oh, and the other problem, and I'll show you two other, these are kind of cartoons, Thomas Nass cartoons about the violence of elections in the 1870s, 1880s. The other problem here, two more NASA cartoons in the North, the problem was money. That these political candidates, these political parties, were spending so much money to win elections. It was legal in this country, perfectly legal, until the year 1925, to pay voters to vote for you. And every candidate did it. Every single one. So you had people like me who would say like, how much are you going to offer me? How much are you going to offer me? How much are you going to offer me? The price of a vote was really being bid up. And you know the, the, the offices tended to go to the highest bidders. And that's what Thomas Nass is trying to show in these two cartoons here. So in uh, 1888, Massachusetts, a progressive state, decided that they're going to experiment for the first time with the secret ballot. They did these things. They shut down all taverns and liquor stores on election day. Boo! <laughs> that was not popular. <laughs> then they instituted a secret ballot. You do not have to bring your own pencil, you do not have to bring your own paper, uh, and we will give you the ballot that you will check off names. It will be secret, nobody will know you voted. It went really well. No violence, no killing, uh, you know, the, it, it was a legitimate election, and four years later, Virtually every state in the Union adopted the secret ballot. So the year 1892 is a very historic year. It's really when this country went to the secret ballot for the first time universally. I believe there was one holdout, and I believe it was West Virginia. And I think West Virginia still has a book on the laws where you could still hold an election by voice vote if you want. So when you go out to vote on November 3rd, be thankful that you're not going to get beat up, hopefully. 
<laughs> and uh, that the, the scene of voting will hopefully be more like this and less like this. All right. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions or comments? <laughs> yes, I do. I'd like to politely disagree with what I think your opinion was about the Electoral College. Oh, I knew. Yes, the Electoral <laughs> College is a very contentious issue. Yeah, the Electoral College primarily was designed to protect the minority against the majority. If it didn't exist, you would have uh, the entire policies of the country being run, for example, by the public officials in the New York, Philadelphia area, the Chicago area, and the West Coast against all the rest of us. Secondly, the U.S. Congress, uh, the Senate is made up of just two representatives for each state, no matter what the population of the state is, whether it's uh, Rhode Island or California, that is, was the second effort to protect the uh, the huge minority in the country. And minority, what minority was at that time were small states. Small states. It was to protect small states. Uh, Delaware was not going to join the Union unless there were protections like the ones you described. Uh, absolutely. Think about the election that we're going to have in November. It's not a national election. And if you run for president, if you run a national campaign for president, you're going to lose. It is 50 individual state elections, 50 individual state elections. Let's say we got rid of the Electoral College, like you suggested, that I suggested. Um, let's say we got rid of the Electoral College. Uh, why would any candidate ever go to Wyoming or Utah, right? I mean, what's the point? Go where the voters are. If you're just looking to rack up the popular vote, you're going to go to where the people are. So every candidate would be catering, as you said, to votes in Los Angeles, Chicago, Pittsburgh, uh, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, you know, the, the Dallas, Miami, the populous cities. That's where, that's, your, that's where you'll vote, that's where, that's where you'll get your voters. So absolutely, it would fundamentally change our election system. Absolutely fundamentally change how campaigns are run. One other thing, not to dominate the session but when the Greeks, invented democracy 450 years before Christ was born. You're right, they used to herd in Athens 40,000 people into a town square to fact, practice self-government. It became like mob rule. They, they were too emotional. They uh, lacked foresight. But you're right, a, dem a democracy doesn't work, but a representative democracy is pretty effective. That was the view of the founding generation that was really learned its lesson from the classics, from the ancient Greeks. Any other comments or questions? All right, well, thank you once again. This is a great night out. I appreciate it. <laughs>